Hello, I'm Jeremy Faust, Medical Editor-in-Chief of MedPage Today. Thanks for joining us. Today, we are joined by Dr. Paul Offit. He is a member of the Food and Drug Administration Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, the Verb Pack, which is the committee that publicly discusses and debates and ultimately votes on recommendations related to the COVID-19 vaccines and their authorization for use. Dr. Paul Offit, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Let's start by talking about uh, an article you wrote in the New England Journal of Medicine, COVID-19 Boosters, Where From Here. You argued, essentially, that these mRNA vaccines in particular were designed to do something very specific, which is to prevent severe disease and deaths, and that you know they happen to temporarily do what everyone else wants them to do, which is to decrease infections. It seems to me that people, a lot of people are looking at boosters, and they don't realize it, but they're treating them like they're almost like prophylaxis. And that, I think, in your view, is not a sustainable way to do things. How do you think this is going to play out? I think probably you can you can um, trace the confusion back to December of 2020. In December of 2020, the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee was asked to consider both Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines. Those were two-dose vaccines given three or four weeks apart. And protection against mild, moderate, and severe disease was 95%. Those vaccines were roughly 95% effective at preventing not only severe illness, but also mild illness. And um, then what happened was six months later, the CDC did, did studies showing the protection against severe disease was holding up, which was good, but the protection against mild disease was fading, as you would have guessed, because protection against mild disease is for the most part mediated by neutralizing antibodies present at the time of uh, infection, and those fade. So why was it 95% protection against mild disease in December of 2020, those were three-month studies. Those participants had just gotten their second dose. So therefore, you sort of had this unrealistic sense of what this was all about. And that's the way it was handled. That was the way it was handled, not only by the media, but I think in many ways by public health officials, yeah. officials who use words like fading immunity or breakthrough infections, when you were seeing exactly what you would expect to see. Even one year later, when studies were done by like, uh, Mark Tenford out of uh, CDC, with just two doses, you found that protection against severe disease was holding up. Then Omicron hit, which was an immune evasive strain and um, caused um, mild illness, even in those who were, who were vaccinated. And I think this sort of led to a lot of confusion, and ultimately led to a third dose and led to a fourth dose. And I think we use terms like fully vaccinated as compared to fully vaccinated and up to date. And I think it would be hard to find 10 Americans who would agree on what it means to be protected against this virus. I think that's fair. Now, I think that the, I actually think this next question is sort of out of order, but I think it's important that we do it first. And that is that you are, as I mentioned in the introduction, you're on the, the committee, the verb pack that looks at these questions of what we should do next and makes recommendations. And you voted against the bivalent booster, that is using a booster that's got um, some of the old strain and some of the Omicron in it. And you voted against that for the fall. And I'd like you to talk us through your thought process and why you think that um, doing uh, doing it your way would be better. The studies that were presented to us on June 28th of this year, 2022, by both Pfizer and Moderna were done the right way, which is to say they gave people um, th three doses of, of the ancestral strain vaccine. And then the fourth dose was either the ancestral strain vaccine or the fourth dose was a bivalent vaccine. And the bivalent vaccine in both cases, Pfizer and Moderna, was um, the ancestral strain plus BA1, the original Omicron strain. They then looked at the difference in those neutralizing antibody responses based on whether you got the ancestral boost or whether you got the bivalent boost. What they found was, depending on how the study was done, because Pfizer did 30 micrograms or 60 micrograms, uh, Moderna did 25 micrograms for, for the ancestral, then 25 micrograms for the, um, for the Omicron strain, they found that the difference in neutralizing antibodies was either 1.5 fold greater against neutralizing antibodies for Omicron if you got the bivalent strain as compared to if you just got the ancestral strain, or 1.75 greater or 1.97 greater. And the, the implication was that that's good enough, that those statistically significant differences were also clinically significant differences. When we knew that back in December of 2020, when you looked at the neutralizing antibody differences between Moderna and Pfizer, there was roughly a two-fold greater neutralizing antibody response for Moderna than Pfizer, but that didn't really matter in terms of protection against severe illness. So why were we making this difference of 1.5-fold or 1.75-fold or 1.97-fold 
greater with the Omicron boost than the, the uh, ancestral boost. Why were we making that seem as if that was going to be the answer to all our problems? Plus, the BA1 strain is essentially gone. It's been replaced by BA5, BA4, and now BA2121, which is or just Omicron um, subvariants, which are somewhat distant from BA1. Um, so I think that, that, that where this has settled out is that I think the administration is interested in having a bivalent vaccine where one of the strains is the ancestral strain and the other strain is BA5. And we'll see. But I, I certainly hope that before they launch that kind of program for the American public, they show clear evidence that there is a dramatic increase in neutralizing antibodies with BA5 associated with that boost. Because remember, even with boosting the ancestral strain, you do get somewhat of a broadening of immune response, as Linda Safe and coworkers showed in a New England Journal of Medicine paper at the end of June. So I think that's the burden that, that it should be held to because otherwise it's just marketing, right? Otherwise it's like, okay, I'm going to give you BA5 because BA5 is circulating and therefore it's going to be better, uh, which theoretically makes sense, but you need to have clear, clear evidence, preferably clinical data, but at the very least compelling immunological data. Now, would moving to a bivalent booster just in general be progress against this concern about imprinting or angenic sin. The idea is that, you know, whatever you, your body sees first, um, it sort of narrowly responds to that. And therefore, in the future, you don't, ha your body doesn't mount as good of a, of a response because of that initial, what it initially saw. Does giving bivalent anything um, actually uh, have some benefit there just on those grounds? Again, it should be proven, but the, the imprinting thing was, was originally um, defined by a, a researcher named Thomas Francis, who was working with influenza back in the 50s, and he used the term original antigenic sin. And the thinking was this, you can tell um, when children were born based on the way they respond to influenza, either natural infection or immunization, because they respond as if they're responding to that original infection. The original infection that they, they had when they were children, if they then get a vaccine or a secondary infection, their best re they're, they're responding as if they're responding to that first infection and not recognizing the subtle differences with that either vaccine or, 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 or natural infection. And that's what you worry about here, that you sort of lock people into this response against the ancestral strain and don't um, have, a, have the chance then to have a broader response. I will say this, though. The ancestral strain is the original strain. It's the Wuhan strain. I mean, the one that first raised its head in Wuhan, you know, in October, November 20, uh, uh, 2019, um, has served us well. I mean, even all the way through, even including the Omicron and the Omicron subvariants, it does appear to continue to protect against serious illness, yeah. um, which is um, the goal of this vaccine. At least it was the stated goal of this vaccine. But I feel like we're drifting a little bit from protection against serious illness to try and protect against all illness. And I, I would argue that there are some people who can't handle a mild illness. They can't handle it because they have severe heart disease, or severe lung disease, or because they have, you know, out of control diabetes or whatever. So that when they get a mild or moderate infection, they're more likely to develop a severe illness or because they're immune compromised. So that's different. I mean, that, that's really not fading memory. It's someone who either never had a very good immune response because they're immune compromised or because of their age, they, they don't make very good so-called cytotoxic T cell responses. So they're not as able to sort of corral the infection and keep it as a mild or moderate infection. And so that's, you could argue that that group may benefit from, from a boost, if you will, to keep neutralizing antibodies high to the extent they can make neutralizing antibodies for a few months during the time when these viruses are at peak circulation. You could make that argument, but I think, we're sort of not making that argument. We're making the argument of boosters for all. And yeah. first of all, I think people are a little weary of boosters at this point. Yeah, I mean, look, the way I'm looking at it is this. People who, as you mentioned, have another risk factor for hospitalization probably need to stay what we'd call up to date uh, on their vaccine so that they don't encounter mild illness because mild illness has implications for them that they don't have for others. And it's not that they'll get severe disease, it's that they'll uh, severe COVID, it's that, that mild illness will make something else severe. And that's what we keep seeing and, and the data are bearing this out. So absolutely, I think staying up to date for older populations makes sense. I, I, I don't think the mRNA vaccines are, the, are optimized for this, but they're the best we've got. So that's what we're stuck with for now. But I agree with you that, you know, we, we could we could kind of spend all of our effort on, on that group and, and have hu huge huge, huge um, benefits instead of diffusing the, uh, the the efforts, the money, the signal, and um, it, for, for very little in return. Um, but I do, as I think about younger people, some younger people obviously really want doses. They, they, they bought into this idea that um, they just um, 
these vaccines can can eliminate infection. And you also, I think we and I agree on this. We, the benefit for boosting for young people is is very transient, if any. Um, but over time, I think you, you know the the arguments have been made that that say, okay, look, there's a lot of good reasons to boost younger people. Where do you stand right now? Do you still think that two doses of the ancestral vaccine is sufficient for most people? Uh, and have you softened on third doses for any younger people? Um, and I guess the the third question of a three part is, who do you think right now needs more than two doses? I, I still would argue that for a healthy young person, two doses appears to continue to protect against severe illness. What that third dose does do though, for Omicron meaning BA1 and the Omicron subvariants is, is you do get an increased response against those variants and subvariants, you do. The question is, does it matter? Because still it looks like you're protected against severe illness. So does it really matter to get that third dose? Um, I would argue, no, I think that ship has sailed. I think this is now a three-dose vaccine for the most part, because that's the way the, the uh, press and the public has, have, has handled it. It's the way public administrators have handled it. But I still would argue, if you looked at that Mark Tenford paper that was published um, yeah. on infectious diseases, um, what he did was he looked at two doses for one year, meaning for so in, up through December of 2021. So the vaccine had been out for a year. So you're looking through the D614G variant and the alpha variant, the Delta variant. And what he found was that protection against serious illness was holding up. And this was for 80% uh, of the people in that group had at least one comorbidity. Um, a, a significant percentage were uh, over 65. So that was holding up pretty well. Um, but then Omicron hit. And, you know, we, we clearly have shown that three doses is better than two for Omicron in terms of preventing hospitalization. My question is, who are those people? And I think that's not everybody. I, I still think it would be helpful for the CDC to sort of substratify that. And to some extent, they have. They've showed us that at least 75 percent of those who are getting hospitalized, uh, despite getting having uh, two doses, were, you know, were in these high risk groups that we just talked about. So focus on them. I, I think that is what makes the most sense to me. Yeah, if you look at the CDC's readouts, I think we've discussed this before offline. I'm not sure we've discussed it in public, but it's actually very difficult to tell the difference between a person who got their second dose a year ago and a person who got their third dose a year ago. And the, so the idea that it's a three-dose vaccine uh, kind of only makes sense in that in the moment in the period of time for which the third dose increases those neutralizing antibodies. So yes, you could tell the difference between someone who just got a third dose, but you also can't tell the difference between someone who just got their third dose and someone who just got their second dose. So it really matters is how far are you out from your, your most recent dose. And I think that the the public is basically not going to keep doing this except for high risk groups. Is that is that a fair read? Very fair. And I think, you know, it's when we compare sort of vaccinated to unvaccinated, or, you know, got a two doses versus three doses, you need to also account for who's gotten naturally infected in the meantime, mm -hmm. because that does alter things. And it is knowable. I mean, you can know that by looking at, say, antibodies against um, you know, say the nuclear protein, which is only going to happen if you've been naturally infected. So I think that also is one of the problems is controlling for natural infection, which now is common. You know, I remember when the, a couple of months into this um, pandemic, John Udell, who was the head of uh, virus research at uh, the National Institutes of Health said, three years from now, you're going to have two choices, be naturally infected or be vaccinated. And if you look at some of these recent seroprevalence studies, you know, you see there was one in JAMA recently showing that, uh, you know, as many as 90 percent of people have, have either been naturally infected or vaccinated when they look at sort of thousands and thousands of lots of people who have donated blood. Now, that's limited by who chooses to donate blood, but I still think uh, it's striking. Well, right. And I think that um, the, the idea, maybe a cognitive shift that I made at some point was, you might not necessarily uh, have to choose between infection or vaccination, but you have to choose infection with protection or infection without protection. In other words, do you walk into that infection or that exposure with with uh, a vaccine on board or not? Um, and you want to do that, obviously. I want to make sure that we don't like make incorrect news here. You said you think it's a three dose vaccine, but you said that because you think that, that basically the scientific debate is over because no one's having it, not because the science supports that, but basically on a marketing. Is that correct? Yeah, I just got an email today from a, a mother of a college student who was upset that, that her child can't go to a, a certain East Coast school because he hasn't had his third dose. And she argues reasonably, look, he's a healthy young person. He's gotten two doses. He's a man who or boy who is at an age range where he is at some risk for myocarditis. And I don't think the benefits outweigh the risks here. Perfectly reasonable argument. I agree. I agree with her. 
But I also think that, uh, as, as uh, my, my friend Carter Mesher pointed out to me when we discussed this like a year ago, that most people who get a third dose, even in that group, not, the young and healthy male, most people will be happy with their decision to get a third dose because for 99%, it makes no difference. For a small, tiny group, it, make it, it would help. For a small, tiny group, it would hurt. And so most people will just be happy with their decisions because whatever they did, they, they think, well, I got a third dose. I did my best. And therefore, the administration is saying, well, look, if it breaks even, we might as well just make everybody happy. Yeah, there was there was an old uh, study that was done at, at a Canadian racetrack where they asked people to to rate their horse while they were on the way up to making the bet. And then they asked obviously a different group of people to rate their horse after they'd already made the bet. Obviously, after you've already made the bet, you rate it much higher. But I, what I loved about that article was the title, which was "Post Decision Dissonance at Post Time." <laughs> at post that right, uh, yeah, post backs uh, something or other. We could do it with that. The um mix and match, the, the, the idea of starting with one uh, formulation, Pfizer, and, and then boosting with Moderna, uh, do you think it matters? And we certainly it, it uh, has a little bit more of an antibody response and more side effects. But on a population level, do you think it matters? Like if, if, if someone asks you, what should I do? What do you tell them? Yeah, we'll wait for data. I mean, it, it is interesting to see some of these early reports now of boosting with Novavax, which is a purified protein vaccine that's adjuvanted with the same adjuvant that's used in Shingrix, which is an exceptional vaccine. Um, or if, if you've already gotten, say, two doses or three doses of an mRNA vaccine, then you get this dose of Novavax. The antibody studies, at least the small ones that have been reported so far, look promising. But again, I, you ultimately need clinical data, and hopefully the CDC can help generate those data. 